in a very good company because as the school year comes to a close, everybody in this room has stepped out of a crazy busy schedule to be here at what we hope will be the first of many UCCI conferences hosted by UC. Thank you for making the time to join us, um, to come and join us in learning more about UCCI courses, and also to connect with colleagues throughout the state who share your commitment to preparing students for success. And I want to also give a very special thanks to our invited panelists who will be offering us valuable lessons learned as they share with us the experiences they've had in implementing integrated curriculum at their local school sites. We want for more high schools to be engaged in this type of curriculum reform because it is truly a very good company because as the school year comes to a close, everybody in this room has stepped out of a crazy busy schedule to be here at what we hope will be the first of many UCCI conferences. Thank you for making the time. All right. Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> This, this type of curriculum reform really is game-changing work, especially when we have the odds stacked against us. Nationally, over 25% of high school students who are taking common college entrance exams are deemed not college and career ready. And two out of every five college students require remediation in basic skills. So considering this steep price of remediation, along with the potentially large rewards of students completing their post-secondary training, um, high schools really do play a very critical role as this pre-college springboard. And with more integrated courses that can span the full A through G spectrum, more high schools in our state will be able to help students meet university admission requirements. As we have advanced the UCCI initiative over the last four years, we've reached several key milestones that I wanted to highlight. We've conducted 16 statewide UCCI institutes, where we've had more than 500 teachers total participating with us in those. We've launched our second program, the UCCI Teacher Exchange, and we've held four of these exchange events in just this last year which have helped teachers in uh, the Sacramento, Riverside, Los Angeles, and San Diego areas implement UCCI courses. We have facilitated the development of 68 new UCCI courses at these institutes, with 35 of them earning A through G approval so far. And out of the UCCI courses, we have been able to integrate 10 out of the 15 CTE sectors with the traditional academic disciplines. And finally, since spring 2012, we have more than tripled the number of high schools and districts offering UCCI courses, bringing the total to 109 throughout California. We've also increased the visibility of UCCI through our redesigned UCCI website that we launched in February 2013. And we had further improvements to that that just went live this past March. We have, um, as many of you may already know, um, because you received this, a monthly e-newsletter that has almost doubled in subscribers in just the last year. And you can find, if you haven't already, UCCI is on both Facebook and Twitter. So this, this heightened visibility has led to inquiries about UCCI work from across the country. UCCI is supported by generous state contract funding that's administered by the California Department of Education. And we wanted to thank our contract monitor, Joe Ratting, for that. We also wanted to thank other CDE colleagues, including Leanne Fong-Batkin and Lloyd McCabe, for their continued advocacy at, um, at the state level for UCCI. And then finally, I want to extend my deepest appreciation and recognize my UCCI staff team. If I had a spotlight, I would shine it on each of you. So in lieu of that, would you please stand or wave when I call your name? So Sarah Fidelvis. <laughs> Katie Leslie. 
before you came in the back. Sherry Najaki standing right next to us. Carolina Reyes up in the front. And also Deb McCaskey, who recently transitioned to another role in UCOP articulation, but is here in that role. Waiting from the back room. The overall success of UCCI and the scope of its impact really is largely due to the UCCI team and to the incredible commitment and to the standards of excellence that, that they hold themselves to in delivering only the very best work that defines UCCI. Without this team and, and also without all of you who are here with us as our collaborators in this effort, we would not be able to pave the way for substantive change through in innovative, integrated curriculum for our students. So thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I just want to echo Monica's um, shout out to the UCCI team, which is probably the best team of people I've ever worked with and been working for a long time. Uh, and I also want to say, hey, our live stream works. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Did it out. It's definitely working. That's good to know. We actually had people who, someone uh, messaged me yesterday and said, I never registered. Can we come to the conference? I'm like, well, I don't know because we are completely full. And so uh, I told her we are live streaming it. And she said, oh, great, because I'm sick and I was worried about coming in. <laughs> yes, watch it from home. Thank you. Uh, anyway, so um, next up, I want to introduce you to Stephen Hindle, who is the Associate Vice President for Admissions here in the Office of the President at UC. And uh, Steve is going to talk for a few minutes about UC and our kind of historic role in CTE. So please welcome Steve. How's everybody doing? OK, the men in the room, who are, who's wearing a tie? Oh, man, we have got to get some help. OK, it's, uh, it's beautiful outside. We're in a beautiful room and we're wearing a tie on casual Friday. What, what does that say about us? Well, it says a couple of things. Oh, and you're going to love this segue. How important this work is. Um, but seriously, uh, Sarah has, uh, Sarah and Monica both have indicated we'd really love for you to come talk to the group about the sort of historical formation and the importance of this, of this work for the University of California. And, and what's ironic, frankly, is I'm, I'm probably the least able to talk about that in terms of the specific day-to-day -day work that you guys are doing. I'm, I'm relatively new with the university here, all of eight months, still trying to learn the entire system in that building over there, let alone the campuses. But, but here's my particular perspective, and I hope, and I hope you'll take it seriously. I, I left the university for about 10 years working at the college board, um, and there I worked on community college initiatives, higher education initiatives, and it was, it was great fun. But one of the trends that occurred during that time, and, and this will come as absolutely no surprise to you, is the way in which people are thinking about higher education, the way in which teachers, um, parents, even students, are thinking about preparation for higher education. And, and part of that, of course, is, is, is the whole focus on career and technical education. And it, there's been a real groundswell. Now, if you look at the history of education in America, of course, career technical education has always been part and parcel of that discussion. But of course, it's always been very separate. And in my pre-university life, it was at the university before I was at the college board, um, I think we thought of ourselves quite apart from that work. I think valuing that work in the sense of how it would help certain students in certain careers. But when I came back and I talked with Monica and I talked with Sarah and the group and, and, and a number of you, what's clearly apparent is, is, that, is that those worlds have merged. Now, have those worlds merged uh, because there's been sort of a, a, a realization of that integration? I, I'm not sure. I think it's because of practitioners like yourselves. I think it's because of the opportunity to come together um, that the experts, that would be you in the room, um, have really developed, um, a, again, a groundswell, a, a notion that if we are, in fact, going to be a nation that is competitive internationally, but also at home, we've got to really think about the way in which we prepare our students for, for instance, highly selective institutions like the University of California. So that's why I've always been quite thrilled. Uh, I'm quite thrilled to be here. I'm staying here throughout the morning to learn more. And I don't know enough, and I need to know, to know a lot more. One other thing. 
So just before this meeting here, I, I was in a meeting. And, and by the way, that's all we really do with the office of the president, is go to meetings all day long. But this was an important meeting. It was up in the president's conference room. And they have what they call these daily huddles. And it's not really a football analogy. I don't really like it. But, but listen, it's better than a hug. So they get together in these huddles. And quite um, reasonably, they talk about the day's events. They talk about what's happening at the university and how we can best advise and counsel the president. So it's very good work. I don't get invited uh, very often, and, and you'll soon see why. Um, and then everyone at the end of the huddle goes around the room, and they talk about what's vital and important. So it, it comes to me. And I could tell them about admissions rates or, or that we're getting slammed again in the newspaper about something else. But instead, I talked about this work. I said, well, I'm excited. I'm headed over to Preservation Park. And we'll be talking to the practitioners, teachers throughout California who are thinking about how the A through G curriculum relates, frankly, to students all over the state. And how we can collectively, how they have collectively worked towards pushing this particular model in fundamental and important ways. And I thought, OK, well, I'll just move that along. I'll go on to the next thing. In actuality, the discussion was, was very engaged. People were very excited about it. And it was interesting the dynamic. You had this sort of policy watch in there who were excited because they too have heard about these strands and these streams coalescing together and were fascinated about how the way in which an elite institution like UC, and I use elite advisedly, can pull together these particular notions. But the other part of it were the parents in the room. And the parents in the room were saying, really? I had I had no idea because we thought, in some ways, kind of A through G was kind of disconnected, perhaps, from what was going on beyond the academy. And they were excited as well to hear about that good work. So I must tell you, you're having influence. You're having influence at the, at the very halls of university power, certainly. Um, and I want you to keep pressing this message because, in a sense, it's a, it's a watershed moment. In a sense, you mean the important work that will transcend the state. And if I learned anything from my 10 years at the College Board was the notion that California still sets the mark. They call us kooky, they call us crazy, all true, but we still set the mark. We still advance on these topics, and this one, I think, is more pivotal than maybe all of the rest. So I thank you for your work. I'm going to be sitting here in the front or in the back listening about this good work. Uh, I hope to have an opportunity to talk with many of you about how you're going to advance this work in the future. So thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Steve's a lot taller than I am. Let's come down. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, a really quick anecdote about parents. I've had two call me to see if I could teach one of our courses to their student. I'm like, that's not really what we do, actually. It was interesting. I haven't really thought of rent a teacher, but apparently that's, that's what they thought we are. Uh, so, um, so really quickly, before we bring up uh, Opa and Gregory, I'm going to give some quick context to UCCI. And uh, Carolina's helping me out because we don't have a remote for our PowerPoint. Um, so first of all, I wanted to tell you a little bit, and I mean, if you registered and read the registration carefully, you probably know what you're going to be getting out of this day. So um, first, there is the fact, you know, a little bit about UCCI, our programs, our courses. Um, you will be able to get some networking and partnership time. I mean, one of the things that has become that I think makes the Institute such a profound experience for the teachers who participate with us is they rarely get that time to come together and to really get to know people and, and start forming those partnerships. So we wanted to make sure to build that into the day, which we did via the lunchtime, working lunchtime. Um, so of course, you're also going to hear about integrated curriculum and how to how it works in the classrooms from our teachers. Uh, and then, oh, how to make avail yourself of courses because we are moving to an on-demand model for our UCCI institutes, and we are super excited about it. It's already been incredibly popular. Uh, we're worried about how we're going to get it all done in one year, but we always find a way. So that's what we'll learn about today. I think we can go to our next, next slide. Uh, OK, so basically, I think anyone in this room understands the fact that UC reviews and improves courses in the A through G subject areas. Uh, we currently have over 141,000 courses throughout California that are AG approved. We meaning the state of California, not UCCI. Uh, and so, um, so that's the context in which we're working. So we, we are housed in, in UC's high school articulation units. This graph, the point of this graph is to show you that um, 
CDE, our partners at CDE, they count those courses in terms of how many of them are career technical education in nature, how many of them are CTE courses. And what the graph shows you is that the vast majority of those courses are approved in the G elective area and F visual and performing arts. And so students who want to take a full spectrum of courses with CTE are really limited in their ability to do that if the majority of them are approved just in those areas. Less than 200 are approved in math, English, and history combined. So that is the focus of QCCI work is A through E usually. We do sometimes get into F because it's a good marriage for um, some of the CTE, but that's really our focus to try and help students have a full spectrum of courses. And so that brings us to our mission, which is essentially, I think about UCCI as being about options. We want all students to have access to college and career preparation. And um, one of the things that, that I would just say, I, I was a teacher for 10 years, and I think beyond the fact that um, the career technical education, whether a student, I have an anecdote, I guess. One of my nieces is taking physics right now, and I happened to go to dinner with her right after we had been doing a teacher exchange for our Green Up and Go um, which is an engineering physics course. And so I had been at the school and super excited about it, thinking, why didn't I take physics when I was in high school? Like, they're building all these engines and doing all these things with very applied learning. So I was asking my niece, who's new in high school, uh, I said, oh, what are you taking? And she said, physics. And I said, oh, how do you love it? And she's like, oh my god, it is so boring. But it was boring because she's not doing any of those hands-on projects. And frankly, in my opinion, I don't know how much of it she's going to retain if she's not doing those things. So I think even if she's not planning to be an engineer, she would learn those principles of physics in a much richer way if she had access to that kind of curriculum. So what does it mean when we talk about integrated curriculum? A lot of you here are from linked learning districts, and so that's a huge, huge movement right now. And so we here at UCCI, when we do integrated curriculum, we are talking about a real, authentic, logical marriage between CTE and academics. And so um, we always use this anecdote that one of our participants came up with, which is a perfect way of thinking about it, that um, when they're at the institutes creating the course, they're not creating a layer cake, meaning academics, then we're doing CTE, then we're doing academics again. It's a marble cake, meaning each bite should have a little bit of both things in it. And so the projects are extremely integrated, and they're, they're integrated in that way because it's an authentic and logical integration. It's not trying to slap these two things together. Um, and so what does it do for people? It highlights connections between academic work and uh, we sometimes say the real world, it contextualizes academic work. I mean, that's ultimately what it's about. And it gives students a chance to engage in potential career paths. So even if they aren't planning on doing uh, that work, it's good to find that out before they're trying to major in something in college. And part of UCCI Institutes, which is probably, if anyone's familiar with UCCI, that's what you're most familiar with. It launched in 2010, and as Monica was explaining, um, it launched from SB70 funds, which Sunset now we're funded through SB1070, which I'm sure many of you in the room are as well. Uh, and our funding is administered by the California Department of Ed, and we're so excited that some of our CDE friends are here today. Okay, so that brings us to our first panel, which is really what you want to hear anyway. So first, um, I want you to give a hand for Dr. Okwa Ladner and Gregory Duran, who will come join me on stage. Good morning. Uh, so, both of these individuals have, um, actually one thing I, I quickly want to say is that when Monica was explaining how we've had over 500 teachers throughout California participate in the institutes, that's a good size number, especially since the institute can't fit a whole lot of people at once. Um, but for me, that impact is, goes really beyond the people who participated with us because, and a perfect example is our two presenters up here now because uh, both of them at our Summer 2012 Institute, um, integrating math with information and communication technologies. And they both went back to their districts and decided they wanted to do something with that. And so uh, in Oakwood's case, she applied for one of our grants that we had in 2012. Uh, to develop new courses modeled after a UCCI course. And that's what she did. She took our Algebra 2 for the 21st Century course, which integrates 
uh, algebra two with um, scratch programming. And since her district is going all integrated math for Common Core, she made three new courses uh, that are integrated math with scratch. And uh, Shepard did three high schools through teaching, beginning those courses this year. And then Gregory Duran, he said, I'm going to take the Algebra 2 course, as we call it, off the shelf. Someone told me the other day, these courses are so difficult to create, it's a lot easier to just take the UCCI course rather than model one after it. Uh, and so he brought it to the district that he's a teacher in special, on special assignment in, which is San Ramon Valley Unified, not too far away. And he also had three high schools go through the practice of implementing that course. And so just two people at, uh, at our institutes brought this to six different high schools um, when they came back. And so I think, to me, that's, that 500 number gets multiplied. And you're going to see the same sort of thing in our second panel as well. So uh, OK, so quickly, actually, I would like Oka, you could go first, and then Gregory, to just briefly introduce yourself and talk about your how you came to this work. Uh, the um, open letter. Uh, I currently serve as a uh, teacher on special assignment at a uh, high school called Hillcrest High School um, in STEM education within Harvard Unified School District in Southern California. Um, I finished my dissertation in 2008 from U at USC, and in the process, I came across to numerous research. And reading that research, um, my conclusion was that we, America, as a nation, has a learning and teaching problem. It was based on the data that our um, college students' remediation rate among the freshman students is about 50%. And high school dropout rate at that point was about 40%. And students who are two-year associate's degree within three years, bachelor's degree was less than 40%. So that urgency was implanted in at that point as I was finishing the dissertation. So serving as a teacher on special assignment, I was just kind of reaching out. What is there? The economy, we were in the middle of a heavy recession, 2012. and Common Core was releasing its information, read about college and career readiness. I was just reaching out and met the perfect <laughs> opportunity that was presented by UC. Um, I cannot thank enough um, the power of UC's um, systemic um, opportunity of having UCCI. I didn't really quite understand what UCCI can do. I basically signed up because I read A through G and C D C T E and I translated it into college and career readiness. I translated that into workforce development of this nation, of empowering our students. I translated that into an opportunity to improve teaching and learning. Um, I came about through to UCCI uh, through um, teaching is my second career. I worked in the high tech industry for a number of years before I became a math teacher. And I can't believe that I just finished my 12th year teaching math in San Juan Valley Unified at uh, New School, Doherty Valley High School. But one of the things I remember in the high tech world was how programming really caused people to think. It really forced me to think really hard for the first time when I graduated from after I graduated from UC. And when I came to start teaching math, the math is really cool, it's very interesting, but it's sort of dry, as Sarah alluded to her nephew's story. And I was looking for something more to spice it up. It's sort of like, you know, it's like we're broiling this, we're making this really nice broth, and I needed some base to throw into the overall <laughs> math curriculum. And um, I heard about UCCI um, with applied to participate in one of their events in Burlingame in 2012. And I went over there and worked on the Algebra 1 course. Um, but the Algebra 2 course was the one that was approved. And I was like, perfect. This is fabulous. Uh, it has the programming element to it. And it really has that element, especially now with Common Core becoming um, more mainstream, of that you know, higher order thinking ability to get the programming side. 
So I took the um, Algebra 2 for the 21st Century course to our school district and uh, got support from administration and then just started seeing who in our high schools might be interested in teaching. But it was really just nice having that UCCI um, event to allow us, to allow me to take something that was already developed and be able to now bring it back to our district and move it forward. Okay, thanks you guys. Actually, Carl, will you go one more on the slide? So I, I briefly talked about their courses, um, and Gregory will talk, I'm going to have Gregory talk again in a second, just about um, what it was also like further expanding on why he found that particular integrated course so meaningful for students. Um, so beyond just adding the basil to the broth, uh, what, it, what it actually helped in terms of their learning. Um, and then as I said, OPA's course is modeled after that with an integrated math approach. Uh, and I think if you go to the next slide, we'll Okay, yes. Um, so, uh, Gregory, you, I, this is sort of the portion that I wanted to talk about. I think, Opa, you covered it in a very big, big picture way. Like, what is it that brought uh, both of them to integrated curriculum? So now, um, maybe a little bit more detail in terms of what you think the specific courses that you've been using have offered to students. And, Gregory, I'll have you start since this is your slide. Great. Right, so one of the big, the big shifts in the Common Core is not only the content shift, but I think more importantly, the big thing Common Core is bringing is trying to teach kids how to think like mathematicians. So in the creation of the Common Core, there was a lot of research done on looking at people that were really good at math and how do they think. And those got embodied in an order called the Eight Mathematical Practices. And one of the big challenges we're having at the high school level is not only what is the content, but more importantly is how do we change our teaching practice to start having kids think like that right there. And one of the powers of programming is that if you think about developing a simple program, and I like everyone to think about how you factor the number eight. Right, just think about that. What are the prime factors of eight? And hopefully you came up with two times two times two. Now, if you just take that very simple idea, which we can very quickly do in our brain, but now write a program to do that for any number. Right? That is where now programming becomes very powerful from a mathematical point of view that I have to now sit back and think about how am I going to model that situation, which is one of the eight mathematical practices. How am I going to write a program to take that model that I created, which starts addressing some of the other things in the eight mathematical practices. And that is really the power of programming from, from a math point of view. And it's not so much playing around with the technology from I'm using it to make a game that's sort of nice, but it's really teaching kids how to write a mathematical algorithm to do something that they've been doing forever, like factoring a number or taking a radical of a number. And that's where the mathematical thinking comes into play. And it's helping kids, it's teaching kids to think like really good math people via the math, eight mathematical practices, but getting access to it via a programming element. And to me, that's, that's the really the powerful thing about bringing programming into a Um, I would have to say that in addition to the uh, SMP standards for mathematical practice via programming, helping our students to understand the concepts and skills that are so essential for them to uh, serve as a uh, functioning citizens, they have to acquire the dispositions, the habits of mind, which Going, which goes back to SMP. Um, one of the um, one of the key components that um, let me ask, let me ask Sarah. What was the question again? Let me just address the. So, what you've seen about the courses that you feel is is important um, if you compare them to a, a regular math class. So, why? What does the programming element bring to it? Yeah. The programming element, um, I think as students learn about the scratch right now, the, of the three courses that uh, we created, integrate you know, Math 1 with the ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, through using the um, scratch as a platform. It's a very fundamental programming course. The idea is helping students to learn about the fundamental components, but at the same time, help them to 
be exposed to different opportunities for career development in the future. Um, the college and career readiness connections are readily made when we create programming programming learning opportunities within the math course. In terms of the, uh, um, let me come back to this one later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, something that is just popping into my head just because it's very immediate for me. One of my former students just finished her master's degree, which will really give you a sense of how time is passing when your students are finishing graduate school. Uh, but she got her degree in graphic design and um, is now on the job market. And she feels like every single job she looks at needs she needs to know programming. And she's really regretting not having the opportunity to have learned that while she was working on her design elements in, in her master's program. So I feel like to, to a certain extent, this is going beyond just high school, but all the way into higher ed. I think higher ed needs to be really thoughtful, too, about preparing students for the work that they would be doing when they leave. Because I think often we've gotten really good at preparing students for more academic work and be a graduate school, but not necessarily for work they would do outside of the academy. So um, interjecting my own thoughts into that. Uh, um, OK, so uh, this might be a good opportunity, I think, to go to the next slide, because I believe that's where we have a link to a Scratch program. Um, I'm going to go one more. It should be here. It should be there. It is. Oh, good. There it is. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so Gregory, this is your. I want. I wanted people to see a sample project because otherwise it's just can, this information floating in your head, and to actually see what Scratch does, I think it's really useful. So what you're seeing here on this slide is Scratch, and Scratch is actually a very easy program to learn for kids because it provides a lot of graphical capability that kids don't have to program themselves, and within Scratch it has different blocks to implement uh, different computational mechanisms. And one of the things about Scratch is it's not the most efficient programming language to write a mathematical algorithm, but it's very easy for kids to learn. And you can bring across a lot of the ideas about what the mathematical practices are using Scratch. So it's easy to use. It's freeware. Um, kids pick it up like that. And then we can just focus on the math. And once the math algorithm is done, then you can do, uh, you can put a, like a nice gaming shell around it if you want it. But this particular example is, again, I, I mentioned factor eight. It's just factoring any number. And this is uh, something we did in Algebra 2. Um, it's not really one of the Algebra 2 um, concepts, per se, but it is a mechanism, again, to start teaching kids how to think like mathematicians via program. And I just want to put a number in there. Um, maybe put. 2,176. You have to hit the green flag up on the top. Oh. Great, you got it. All right, so what just happened there is on the left are the factors of 2,176. So one of the big ideas in Algebra 2 from a content point of view is being able to take any polynomial function and come up with the x-intercepts are known as zeros. To be able to do that, you have to understand what the prime factors are. So this, in a way, is an element to help kids understand what prime factors are by taking any number and getting it to its prime factors. So the prime factors of 2176 are 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, then the times times 17. So again, the kids had to come up with a program to do that for any numbers. And one of the things that the kids learn also is off on the right, you see a list of prime factors. So they would have to go out onto the internet and find a little text file which has 10,000 prime factors in it. So the kids would have to go out and learn, OK, where am I going to find something that has a list of prime factors? Well, it's out there. They just had to go out and find a text file. And then with Scratch, they would import it into a it's a thing on the right. And that's really essential to coming up with an algorithm to make a prime factorization of any number. So again, this is something that the kids just Scratch is easy for them. Now they can just focus on the mathematical part, which is what you just saw right there. I'm just going to add to what Gregory just mentioned. As you can tell, it's very engaging, motivating for students to want to learn about not only the Scratch is there, but Scratch is using as a tool to learn mathematics. 
And I want to follow up with that just to say, you saw how super fast that was. Like, if you blinked, you might have missed the fact that it had done all that calculation. But uh, I had the pleasure of being um, at an exchange event where Gregory was our teacher exchange leader, and he was leading teachers through um, the Scratch projects in Algebra 2 for the 21st century. And uh, what the teachers wanted for that event was to be able to get through the project so they would really be able to wrap their heads around Scratch. And number one, it looks super fast and easy, but actually programming that takes a long time. So they were, you know, heads down and really like focused on it. But the other part of it is that Scratch has these um, reward alerts that students can design for themselves. And uh, from the feedback that we've gotten, certainly from Gregory's teachers, is that the students will get really focused on wanting to make that work. And so it has that reward of something I made it does what it's supposed to do, which is. I think really powerful for students, um, particularly if you've ever had to tweak code, you know how exciting it is when something that wasn't working finally is working. Uh, yeah. yeah that, that's actually one of the, the things that's really fascinating to watch kids program because they get the bug of like, I just got to make it work, right? And the thing about programming is it's very, it's like, it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. And it causes <laughs> kids to have to go back and start looking at their algorithm and busting and fixing things. And as a teacher, I'm now out of the role of on the stage, and I'm becoming more of a guide on the side here. And it's really, really powerful to see kids kids working this way. And that is so comical, isn't it? Um, I wanted to mention that um, as students in learning and teaching mathematics, we talk about the importance of conceptual understanding. And we realize how important that is, but often we see the procedural understanding taking much more time than conceptual understanding. I find that as students are engaged in programming process, whether it's via ICT or anything else, they develop their own set of conclusions about a concept. They come up with new conjectures about what ifs. And as they manipulate those concepts, essential concepts, I find that conceptual understanding gets strengthened through programming. Procedural and conceptual understanding, they go hand in hand, but the medium here, we are using Scratch as a book to engage our learners. what you both were saying was, I can't remember the exact wording from the eight mathematical practices, but one of them has to do with persevering and solving problems. And I think programming is a perfect, perfect fit for that because the perseverance comes not from a teacher giving you a grade, but from whether your program is going to do what it, you wanted it to do. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, we hear from both sides. We hear from administrators who want to have their teachers doing this curriculum and are wondering how to get them to start um, shifting their minds. I mean, number one, it can be difficult to collaborate with people in your own department, let alone people in some other department teaching things that you don't normally teach. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, we get certainly a lot of inquiries from administrators who want to know how to start engaging their teachers in this work. And then we also hear from teachers who want to know how to start getting their administrators to understand why they might want to offer this curriculum. So first, since you both um, shepherded teachers through teaching these courses, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about your experiences getting them interested in doing this, especially because you went about it in different ways. Oakla has a convene, she convened people from three high schools to help her write these courses that she wrote for our grant. And so that in itself was quite the endeavor because I think it was about 12 teachers or so that you had working with you. So that's a pretty significant effort. And then uh, Gregory, you, I know, had presented to faculty to see who among who among you wants to give this a go. So, um, Opa, do you want to respond first? Um, 2012, as soon as I learned about the uh, uh, Pathways grant, um, I presented this information to, to three high school principals. And one of the high school principals uh, basically said, Opa, if you can make this happen, I'm going to make sure that this course can be the very first course and the rest of them can be implemented at my site. And um, I it just, I needed that. 
and you needed an administrator who can say, who can say create it, so we can implement it together. So I took his word and I went after it. Um, Katie and Sarah played such an instrumental role in laying out the groundwork. As I was pursuing that process, um, there were a lot of um, uh, flashbacks from the district team as well as at different sites because we were all learning about Common Core. We were all getting acquainted with the integrated pathway. Um, so I kind of embraced all those challenges and very much was focused on creating integrated math one with ICT two and ICT three and ICT. Anyhow, it took like five months, Katie. Five months, was five months. And when the courses were created after creating three teams, and um, as we were receiving a three G approval status from UC Doorways, um, the district took it seriously, took it seriously, brought teachers together, basically said we have three courses that are A3G approved, in a great math, basically we embraced all the criteria that were laid out within the Common Core, just embraced them in the binary, the courses, and worked on them. So right now, today we have, the district is has um, embraced the integrated pathway. We are implementing which ICT, math three with ICT, and teachers are creating units, the units and the lessons based on those uh, uh, criteria that are laid out in each course. But I have to say, um, a critical mass administrators who can back up this type of work. Uh, administrators who are visionary about doing something that's innovative but yet being willing to take risks. Um, for teachers, I have to say, one of the greatest challenges that we had this year was that our math teachers were teaching scratch component, of course. And not only we had to get used to teaching integrated course content with Algebra 1 and Geometry, but additionally, teachers had to learn about the content of teaching Scratch. And there were a set of, there were a list of uh, things that we told ourselves that we are going to do differently next year. So it's been a, uh, it's been an extremely uh, uh, laborious journey, but a very good one. Thanks, Akwa. Um, so, what I learned in the high tech world, and how many of you are administrators out there? Right, you don't have to answer this question verbally, but I just want you to think privately to yourself. When someone brings an idea to you, do you say yes and or no if you disagree with it? And you don't have to tell me which way you're voting on that, but I want you to think about that question. One of the Biggest lessons I learned as I was becoming a manager in the high tech world was the power of yes and versus no. If I needed to say no to a project, it was better to say yes and, and the and then contained maybe what my concerns were or what the team needed to overcome to get my approval. And what that did is it kept the ideas moving forward. And once the ideas kept moving forward, better ideas emerged from that. And one of the things that I really find really nice about Santa Rosa Valley Unified School District, the administrators in our district, is their approach is yes and, all the way from the principal level to the superintendent level to the school board level. And that is huge for things like the UCCI courses because when I brought the idea to the principal at my high school, Dirty Valley High School, the answer was, already like on their way to UC Berkeley. And so that and made me really pause and think about, OK, we need to be able to make this available to the, all, all the ranges of kids um, in, in our district. So um, once I assured my principal that this was indeed a, a course that could be accessed to all levels of kids, 
Then the principal goes, let's let's go forward with it at, at Doherty Valley High School. Um, so I was like, yes, all right, we got we got progress here. So then I knew some teachers at the other high schools, and one in particular, um, I approached and said, well, what do you think about this? And he was like, this is really really interesting as well. So he and I made a video of what this course was, what the scratch uh, piece was, and then we presented it to his principal. And his principal was like, this looks really interesting as well. So once we had some critical mass in place, then we could take it to the district director level, and, and then it just was, was smooth sailing from there. But the other thing that made it really, really easy from that point was having the UC stamp of approval on it. And I remember sending Katie a couple emails going, this is really improved math course, right? <laughs> and Katie would be like, yes. And I was like, okay, i got to double check this again. This is really an UC improved math course. And Katie goes, yes. And I, because we just wanted to, Algebra 2 is a really important course. And it's the gatekeeper to UC admissions. So we had to make sure that it was really in place. So once we had all that in place, it was really, really easy to move forward. But having you together to help this person understand. Uh, Gregory, there was, um, in terms of when you were saying, you know, this is such a gatekeeper towards UC admission, can you talk a little bit, because one of the things that was interesting to me when um, Gregory worked with us at the exchange was the teachers were asking him a lot of questions since here he was shepherding people through this process, and they wanted to know, well, how are you designing the assessments here? Because obviously there's CTE learning and there's also the math learning, and so how is, what are the assessments like? And um, one of the things that I found interesting was that you are comparing, you are using the same um, algebra assessments for people in your regular algebra courses as well as in the Algebra 2 for the 21st century. So can you talk about how they're doing? Yes, in terms of how they're doing, um, we have common assessments for our Algebra 2 program. So that means if kids are in the regular Algebra 2 or they're taking Algebra 2 for the 21st century, they're still taking the same quarterly benchmarks, the same final exams. And you know what we saw was you know not that much change in terms of the uh, the performance on the multiple choice exams because multiple choice and that's one of the big I think changes in the Common Core assessment strategies. Multiple choice really just measures procedural fluency and it doesn't really get to the higher thinking problem piece. So what we saw was you know kids thinking out through the 21st century. There wasn't a huge change in terms of like the multiple choice performance. Um, it's yet to be seen. I think we need some more time to marinate in this this idea of programming the mathematical practices to really see how it will address some of the more higher order thinking problems that would exist, like on the new um, SBAC exams, whether the performance tasks or maybe some more of the the free response open-ended questions that are part of that exam. But I, I really do believe, though, that you know you just can't measure this based on one year of data. This is something we've got to do for, for several years, and kids may have to be in it for several years before we're really going to start seeing the return on learning in terms of can they attack the, the higher thinking problems. But I think Bill Gates and Steve Jobs summed it up. I remember a quote from Steve Jobs was, I didn't learn how to think until I learned how to program. And I think that's going to happen to kids as well. And uh, we just need time for this philosophy to keep getting into the math courses. And I think we'll ultimately see the return on this um, in the future. But right now, it's about the same. In terms of uh, integrated math, I have to say that we are all getting used to understanding what integrated math is. We talk about, we read the Common Core framework. We I think we understand what integration should look like, but implementing integrated content in that fully in fashion is extremely And the best part is that we have to learn. We can only improve. We can only make it better. So it's an exciting process. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about 
because I know you were saying you have things that you want to do differently this year in terms of teacher preparation. And one of the reasons that um, I'm excited to have them both here because they have done different courses. I didn't want to have people who have both done Algebra 2 for the 21st century because so many of you are moving towards an integrated math pathway for your common core and your schools. And um, one of the things that struck me when I was at an exchange we did for OPA's teachers was that uh, OPA was very concerned that, oh, they're going to need they're going to need so much work learning the scratch. And my read of those teachers after spending two full days with them was that they were really more freaked out about the integrated math portions. And um, one of the teachers realizing that because each project um, allows for students to put their own numbers into it, uh, was realizing all of the students would have a different equation. And he was you know, essentially saying, oh my gosh, this grading is going to take forever because every student's going to have a different equation. They're not all just going to be answering the same equation that I get them. And I, as a former English teacher, was like, yeah, and all my students wrote a different essay. I had to read them all. What are you going to do, you know? Uh, not a lot of sympathy here, sorry. Um, so, uh, but the, it was, for me, the panic from them was definitely the fact that they were going to be moving through math in a really different way than they had moved through, plus the fact that their students in the class were going to be moving through math in a way that they had been moved through it before. And so, um, OPA was really generous enough. You, you took a, you had the Smarter Balanced Style Assessment that you gave students in two different schools, and she actually shared the raw scores with us. Um, which is on one of our slides. And the reason I wanted her to share it was that I think a lot of people, at least when I talk to teachers, there's a lot of anxiety around Smarter Balanced and the fact that they're expecting their scores to really plummet, not just because the curriculum is different, but because they have students who don't have daily access to computers, and now they're taking tests entirely on computer, and so your facility with dragging and dropping those things, all of that stuff is going to come into play. But to me, what was really striking about OPA's data was that one school, even both, even though both scores were low, one was twice or one, and a lot of that had to do with the teacher buying. So, do you want to speak about that a little bit? The assessment data that you're looking at is, is a smart balance performance test like assessment we call it Minimac. And this item included, it was just one item, included about four or five components. The total raw score was eight. And out of eight, um, the average was taken in a Eight, while the other side has 0 0.7. Quite low, but our integrated math teachers worked really hard this year. Uh, they were inundated with the integrated um, curriculum of integrated math. In addition to that, teaching scratch was such a chore. One of the things that we learned about this year about teaching scratch in uh, integrated math course is that uh, our teachers, what we did was took our students to a computer lab and then just offered, have at it, here is scratch, here is what you need to produce. That didn't really work. So what we did was we, um, before taking that to the uh, computer lab, teachers did a direct instruction on scratch and created uh, goals of what needs to be generated when you are in the computer lab. So when, once the direct instruction portion of the scratch was done in the math classroom, after doing the scratch lesson at a computer lab, it was like, it was so much better. So, and that was just one of the layers. Second layer that we thought about improving this year was that our PRC, professional learning community, uh, in terms of creating intervention opportunities, of the integrated math contents, especially like when we breach in algebra one with geometry, we need to do a better job at it next year. Um, third one that we talked about was uh, uh, students who were having a real difficult time understanding the mathematical concepts. Um, we need to brainstorm what we can do better to meet their needs by providing additional time and support. Um, and actually, Gregory, I'm going to have you follow up on that because in terms, that was, that was another big question was how do you move students through this two different, you know, this meshed content of Scratch and, and the Algebra 2 content. And 
So Gregory, can you talk a little bit about that um, in terms of how it manifests itself in the class? Uh, so Opal was saying, it turned out we had to give them really direct instruction. I think sometimes people think, oh, students, they're digital natives. They'll just get on the computer and do stuff. And there are actually things that they need to be taught to do. So do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, so in our courses, um, the, high, the three high schools implemented a little bit differently in terms of the integration of the, of the software. But essentially, the, the challenge was how you have enough time to do all the math content, and then how you also have time to do the programming piece. That's why I alluded to the programming example. It's, sim it's better to do simple, simpler programs, like a little factory program, to start teaching the mathematical practice, as opposed to trying to do like this this really complex algorithm dealing with polynomials, just because there's not enough time to do that. But once we sort of figured out that we know we need to get through all the same Algebra 2 content, um, and we have this amount of time left for higher order thinking, whether it's performance task or programming, um, the programming needed to be a little bit simpler uh, algorithms like I, I showed earlier. But the way it was implemented in one school was we had uh, Chromebooks. We had basically a set of computers for the class, and the kids would work on it maybe two times a week. Um, and they would just go get their Chromebooks, you know, Chromebooks and work on their computer projects. Um, another high school, they would do it every Friday. And that model seemed to work. Yeah, both models seemed to work well. Um, but, the, but the challenge was, again, making sure that we did get through all of the mathematical content um, and then also being able to add that, that programming piece in, which supported the higher thinking problem. But to get that mathematical piece in required simpler algorithms as opposed to more complex algorithms. I'm just going to be honest. In terms of the course content that we created versus that was the intended curriculum of IM1 versus actually the implementing curriculum. I would say it's about uh, 70 percent, maybe six, between 67 and 70 percent of the curriculum is in, in, uh, implemented. Um, our teachers had a, such a, um, it was so difficult on them at the beginning. What we did was we met monthly from uh, uh, September to February, like it was like one point every other. No, we met September, October, and then we skipped, and then January and March. That that bi-monthly like PRC, all day PRC to generate integrate math lessons, and then to at least to generate a specific scratch lesson. That was very helpful having that component, PRC component. Another component that we talked about was that next year at least spend three days on a scratch project per quarter. That's closely tied to the lesson or the key concept. Uh, so that, I think, is also interesting in terms of the fact that the, the curriculum itself is just curriculum, and it, it needs people to implement it. So there's different ways of going about it, depending on what was comfortable for that teacher and what was the right thing for their particular students. So every Friday versus three days per week for when you're coming down to getting that scratch program done. Uh, which brings me to the kinds of PD, because I think you both had a different approach to PD as well. It seems um, that Gregory on your side, they kind of had initial PD and then collaborated with each other. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. So one thing that's really cool about scratch is it can be used from second grade all the way to 12th grade. And in our school district, we had one of our elementary schools, believe it or not, was teaching their kids scratch at beginning at the third grade level. And so what we did was the, the three teachers that were going to, the four teachers that were going to teach the elementary for the 21st class, is a year ago, right, um, school ended, we did a little two-day scratch institute that was actually led by the elementary school teacher that was already teaching Scratch to their third grade kids. And that was the perfect place to start because really all you need to know in Scratch is how you make the sprites come alive and how you make the sprites communicate with each other. And that's what the elementary school provided, the teacher provided in a very efficient way. And we did that in one day. And then the second day then is then we got into the ideas of what are the mathematical algorithms we could implement for the, for the course. So that's the way we approached the PD, and it was very, very efficient. 
I have to mention Sarah that uh, site administrator at Hillcrest High School where I work has been extremely supportive about allocating time for the, um, the PD to take place. And then the superintendent of the Eucharist Gongho delivering integrated math made a huge difference. Um, and also really quickly before we get, because I know we're, we're starting to run towards the end of our session time and I want people to be able to ask their own questions of our panelists. Um, and so before we do that, Cara, one of the slides in there gives an example of one of the projects, describes it, and I can't remember if it's before or after the slide. Uh, this one? No, I think it's the next one. Uh. Keep going. Okay, I just imagined it. Well, <laughs> one, of, one of the projects in the course, uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is that uh, the projects in the course are not necessarily just about take this set of numbers and plug them in and see what happens, but they're grounded in real world kinds of scenarios. And so one of the projects is where students would be essentially um, creating an algorithm to figure out the spread of a disease in a given area. And so that's the kind of thing that if you work for the CDC, you're going to be doing, or it's information that you would want to know. And so um, they're very contextualized problems, which I think makes it an interesting course in that way. Uh, so I know we don't have um, a microphone to go out into the audience, so uh, I, will, I will repeat your questions um, if you have them. But I want people to have a chance to ask our panel questions that haven't come up yet. So raise your hand if you have a question. If you don't, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the professional development teachers, um, and I'm wondering, um, could a math teacher with no programming background teach this course in your opinion from your scratch? I'll make these teachers, but from your experience, can you talk about that? So um, let me repeat the question just to make sure everyone can hear it. The question was, could a, a math teacher with no programming experience actually implement this course? No, uh, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> The answer is yes, but I would also say that the teacher has to have the growth mindset, meaning um, the teachers have to be willing to learn new things. I mean, if, the teacher, if you're going to force us down someone's growth, that it has to be someone that's wanting to step forward and say, I want to do this, then it's totally possible. Just like anything else, right? One is motivated. When a teacher is very um, has a very strong belief system that I can make a difference and I can learn that knowledge or content, the, the process goes much better. I have to say the answer is yes. That was our case. Our math teachers did not have any scratch background um, at all. And what we did was um, the ongoing PD really helped. But when Sarah came down last year through the UC exchange that also added another layer of assistance. If I were to redo the entire process, if I were to receive the full hearty support from the district office, provide at least one week PV during the summer before school year begins, help math teachers to get acquainted with the scratch, possibly reach, support them to reach the proficient level with a scratch, and at that point, they are more likely to implement that process with um, fidelity. Uh, and then provide ongoing support, possibly bring a district team together after school hours, help them to generate lessons, math lessons with a scratch. And additionally, I would have teachers to demonstrate, showcase the products of their lessons at the district level. Okay, good question, by the way. Yeah. Um, Gregory, you have mentioned that you guys offer both this course and your traditional module to um, what is normally even offered. My question is kind of twofold. Number one, uh, programming wise, do you guys have open enrollment? Students can choose either or, or do you target your students into <coughs> different sections? Um, and then the second part is how big is your school? How many sections are you running? Of, the, the new course versus the traditional algebra. And so the question was, did kids have a choice on which algebra two course they wanted to take? And the answer to that was yes. So we gave the kids you could do regular algebra two or you could do algebra two for the 21st century. So the kids have had a choice on what 
they want to take. That little promotional video I told you about that was also part of, like, here's what this new course is about. In terms of the number of sections, it varied from school to school. Um, at, at one of the schools, we had um, three sections of Alpha 2 for the 21st. Um, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but the regular Alpha 2 is probably six. Um, at the other schools, we had one section of Algebra 2 for the 21st and maybe six or seven sections of the regular. So that's why the numbers broke down. And actually, Opa, do, do students, students have a choice between your courses, the, the integrated scratch courses, and then regular integrated math? At Hillcrest High School, uh, they did not. We just offered integrated math. Uh, at the other two high schools, they had. Is there a programming to, to give them programming credit as well as math credit? That's a good question. Um, so what we did was uh, within the math uh, class time, they were learning about math as well as occasional content on Scratch. But for our game design elective course, the teacher actually took that Scratch portion, began embedding that content through game design. So that was so beneficial. <laughs> One challenging component was that he was reassigned as a coach. <laughs> so he had to leave. And then another teacher came in. So that we had to just, we went through some glitches right there. So, so yeah. they get math credit for game design. So what I'm wondering is if, you, if there's enough you know, programming and math to get credit for if a student were to be placed in IM1 ICT, he gets um, the, he, he satisfies the C requirement, math, right? But if the same student were to be in the elective course, game design, which is a 3G approved, yes. was um, how do they get credit for math if, the, if you have people who are not math teachers teaching your course. I just want to quickly say that that almost seems like a little bit of a question for us, but uh, often we get the question of um, who does UC want teaching these courses? And the answer is UC doesn't have any dog in that fight. We are in no position to decide who is qualified to teach your particular course. If you have a math teacher who, like Gregory, had a very long career in IT, he's perfectly qualified to be teaching that course, and UC has no business saying otherwise. Um, so those decisions are definitely made at the district level, uh, but it seems like, Gregory, you, you do, do either of you have someone who's not a math teacher teaching the course? Well, in our district, algebra, this is Algebra 2, and even if it was in the Algebra 1 course, if it's, if it would be a fully credentialed math teacher. We would not have a non math person teaching this course just because it is a math course. All our teachers are credentialed to teach uh, integrated courses, so that I have not had to deal with that issue yet. But we are in good standing. The teacher who teaches the uh, game design course, uh, who embeds the scratch here and there, he has a CTA credential. So it's not an issue. Okay. For us. You've had your hand up for a while. Um, so does anyone know of a scratch teacher prep course in the summer? And also, is your video, your promo video for that course, so Okay, so can we access the promo video and also does anyone know of some scratch training people could get this summer? Yes, the promo video is available, but it's really rough. It's rougher than that. <laughs> but it, it sort of is rough. Um, well, I was going to say, in terms of one thing I would say is that if you, um, Gregory does fantastic scratch training for people, and if, if people wanted to um, try and implement this course, 
in the second half of today after lunch, I'll talk about how you can schedule a UCCI exchange. And since they're done entirely to meet your needs, we go where you are, when you are, and we come to you. And he's, I've seen him lead this training. He is phenomenal. And so, um, so he could be your training in the summer. <laughs> Oh, were you, were you going to say something? I totally concur, and maybe possibly in the future, um, Kathleen, maybe PD component of Scratch can be embedded in UC Exchange venues. <laughs> An idea. Yeah, we want to do it. Um, OK, yes. Hi, this is really exciting. I'm curious about Scratch and whether some of the skills you know, sort of considering Scratch like an introductory way to get into programming if you considered S plus or R or other languages as alternatives, or is Scratch really is probably the way to go at this point for the <coughs> first level but for the purposes of integrating it into math and science? For me, I'm not very savvy with the programming at all, but when it was presented to me, I understood. And a lot of our math teachers who do not have that very strong programming background, they get it. And I like Scratch because this is a math course, and first and foremost, the most important thing we've got to get through is the math content. And so this is not a programming course, so Scratch is just very natural fit in because it's so easy to learn. I also think Google's working on something um, that sort of Scratch-like, so I think as more and more of that free work becomes available, there might be other alternatives to Scratch. It actually might make it more easier from a math point of view, but um, but I think you, we need something that's very easy to learn because first and foremost this is a math course, so we've got to get through the content. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it a, a good line to have to help prepare students for studying exams? Or move on to another program? Or is that so different that it's, it's not a good practice? So uh, we have another course, which is a, a Java-based algorithmic geometry class. So Scratch would not help with regards to being a stepping stone to instantly learning Java. But what, what, what Scratch is doing is the thinking process. It's, it's taking kids through modeling something mathematically and then developing an algorithm programmable. And um, so that, that is something that's totally transferable. But in terms of like, you know, I know Scratch, hence I can learn Java much faster. There's no way. Yeah. Um, CSU so takes a great future role in our region of bachelor's and teaching thought to reading and writing. So, our ELA major is the alternate guidance in regards to what level you expect from the people to be in high school. How are we not getting the same love from the higher, higher, higher learning, higher learning, higher learning, higher learning, higher learning, What are the articulation from higher ed in these in the programs? Um, what was the connection between what's happening at the high school level and what's happening at the yeah right. So I know here in the in the Bay Area. Um, Dr. Garcia out of UC Berkeley, he uh, works in the computer science at UCB. He's an amazing individual with regards to uh, bringing all of the computer science people here in the Bay Area together um, on a regular basis. And the big meeting is going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. It's um, up on UC Berkeley campus. So he, I sort of view him as sort of like the guiding light for some of the things that we implemented in our district with regards to this course, because um, it's UC Berkeley, he's in the UC Berkeley environment, he's in the UC Berkeley computer science area, so that's happening here, I think, for, for the here in the, in the Bay Area, but I'm not sure what's happening throughout the rest of California. I am really envious of that opportunity. I think uh, that uh, articulation process between high schools and community college, and then to CSUs and UCs, possibly the county office can take that role to create that process. Um, I have reached out to local community colleges, but 
I think when districts come together to adopt a A through G approved course and then make that articulation connection, make those connections with the local community colleges, it's more doable. It, the process of generating MOUs, creating articulated courses, and it's very, very lengthy. Uh, I just feel like I want to respond to that as well, working as I do for UC, uh, which I think it's, there's a huge responsibility on us in higher ed, not to be putting it on the high schools to try and figure this out, but to be their partners in helping them along in this way, especially if we're saying you're sending us students who aren't prepared for the work that we're doing here. And one of the ways that UCCI is engaging in that is that, um, so under our new institutes model, which I'll talk about later, one of our first institutes that's planned is for the hospitality industry. And the people who came to us were from the community colleges. They were not high schools. And they said, we um, number one, we get a lot of students who come to the community college who are not prepared. to. They don't know what they want to do, or they think they want to go to a hospitality program, but they have no foundation in it at all, and they don't get very far. And so um, this institute is actually going to have teachers from the high school, CSU, and uh, community colleges. It's the Bay Region San Mateo that came to us. And uh, what they wanted was courses that would prepare students for their programs, but also articulate to CSU and UC. And the courses that will be prepared or created there will be Spanish, um, integrated common core math, and then uh, history as well. Um, so, so we are beginning that work in a lot of ways. And it really does take all three segments to be collaborating, or four segments really, to be collaborating with each other. Because it's not enough, you're right, to do this change in a vacuum. Um, I, I want to give a chance for us to have a break in case people need to run to the restroom or that kind of thing. Um, so I do. I know many of you probably still have some questions, but they will be with us throughout lunchtime. Um, I don't want you to mob them all at once, but <laughs> but I also think that some of your questions might get answered by our other panel, which um, has two different kinds of courses. But Oakwood, oh, did you want to add something? Yes, I just would like to <laughs> express my appreciation to you, Slopi. UCCI. Uh, the work that has been done at my uh, district of creating three integrated math courses, it's been so powerful. It's been very contagious, helping other districts to embrace integrated pathway. And um, I want to say thank you, Sarah, for leading the process um, with so many teachers. And there's a secret ingredient in uh, UCCI that is uh, Katie Leslie. <laughs> Once she embarks on the journey of working with the team to create a course, she goes all the way. <laughs> she does indeed. It's so, so powerful. And Sherry taking care of logistics and Carolina can do all this work without them. And Deborah, thank you. And most importantly as well, Nina, for you see the always work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Opa. Um, so thank you to Opa and Gregory. So um, with that in mind, we have about 10 minutes. If people can reconvene at 11.30, that gives us the time to set up our next panel and gives you a chance to make a phone call if you need to or whatever you need to do. Uh, is it okay if I plug my phone into the house yeah. room space? Hi everyone, we're going to be on break until 11.30. Thank you for joining us. Hey, how's it going? Hi. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm gloves. Thank you. Do you want to? <laughs> today. This one I'm ready to work. I need a little more motivation. Um, would you like to review what my order? Or are you guys okay? No. Well, I say no, but then might as well. Yeah, I would as well.
I was actually coming over to see if you might uh, use my phone to take a photo of us. Yeah, of course, I can do that. So, share with our school family. So, that's your first slide, yeah. and then we're going out here for summaries. Yeah. And then we have this music. Yeah. Recorded music project. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm just going through your slides just so that yeah. you can let me know if you want to switch anything. So this is your yeah. um, summaries of both courses. Mm -hmm. And then we have the recorded music project. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the recipe project. And the napkin. <laughs> and that's it. Is that all right? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. Time to speed folding. Do you want to pull that back? No, one more, one more. I'm going to swing if you can remember. You know how to do this, right? Yeah, I want my own too. Just take a couple of these out. Okay. Share them with my buddies. Dr. Dewey, how are you? Hey. That was awesome. You're such a, you're so succinct and measured. And such good things to say as well. How do you <laughs>
Um, so our second uh, and final panel today is um, John Dewey, who is principal of Garden Street Academy. He's the person closest to me here. Uh, and then um, Melissa Garcia, who teaches at uh, Garden Street Academy there in, in Santa Barbara. She teaches Spanish and culinary. They're going to have to share microphones because there's three of them. Uh, and then the third person up there is Ian Putnam, who teaches a course called The Business of Music. Uh, it's approved in the F area um, and integrates with entrepreneurship. And Melissa's is uh, a Spanish course. Um, it's called Comida y Servicio, and it's uh, a Spanish culinary course. And they are also another example of when I was talking about how that 500 people that have participated with us leads out into more people beyond that because John was at an institute of ours uh, in spring of 2013 and we were integrating language other than English, which is the E area of the A through G. And uh, we were integrating that with health science. And he was so excited by his uh, participation there that he thought, well, I don't see why we couldn't do this with other courses at our school. And so even though their courses are not UCCI courses, they were modeled after UCCI courses. And um, they speak to the really interesting kinds of integration that people can do when they have put their minds to it. So um, please give a round of applause for our next panel, John Lundstedt. And uh, first, I'm going to have quickly, um, I want to have John talk a little bit about what essentially your school, what, what kind of um, school you are overseeing, and then why you felt that integrated curriculum would be important to your students. All right, thank you. Um, and to echo uh, Oklahoma, too, the, the uh, work of UCCI is magnificent and um, the leadership is is um, so supportive, and I just want to thank you again, and thank you for allowing us to be here. So my background is uh, in language teaching, and I'm a school administrator. My research is in organizational theory and teacher teams. I came across UCCI Institute from the counselor emails that were sent by UCP. I'm also a college counselor. And, um, and I've been writing courses for a while, and I looked at this and I thought, well, that does sound interesting. I think I can give something to that. So I signed up for the institute, and I worked with um, a team of teachers on LLTE, I believe it was the third year, Spanish course. And um, I was then subsequently invited to be a facilitator. I worked with OQA on a algebra, you know, integrated math two with biotechnology. Very interesting. Um, I came back to my site, and Melissa here, she had already said to me that she wanted to spend more time with Spanish three students on culinary. And I had said to her, well, within the framework of HG, given the parameters that we had submitted to the university, you can't just spend all the time in color. That's not going to fly, sorry. But there's this opportunity where we can integrate Spanish 3 with a CTE uh, sub um, area, content area. So we got to work on that. And then Ian, Ian had already started taking his students to um, area factories, you know, um, music factories and things. And he was interested in the entrepreneurship aspect. And a lot of the guest speakers that, that came to his classes talking about just being musicians um, were more and more revealing business aspects to music and music production. So at the end of that school year, I presented this UCCI information to my staff, and in particular to these guys. And we just got to work. And we didn't know what the outcome would be just rolled it out and saw what would happen. And our school perhaps is a little different from some of yours. It's a kindergarten through 12th grade school. And we have 120 students total. We have single sections in our, in our upper school. We do not have honors. We do not have AP. So every student takes the course um, appropriate to level. They're heterogeneous groupings. 
mixed ability, and that's how we run our school. And the culture of our school is really about collaboration, uh, project-based learning, experiential learning, hands-on. So it fits with our school culture, and, and it just happened to fit with the ideas that the teachers were having. And as Stephen said in the beginning today, it's about the streams, you know, converging streams, and I think we just happen to hit um, a number of, you know, converging patterns um, that led us to this place. And, um, it's kind of odd to be sitting in front of you explaining it. I never thought that was going to be my role in this, but here I am, and here they are, and, and I thank them too for being here. Uh, so we don't think it's odd because we think you guys have a lot to say. But um, so I, I want to start, Melissa, with you. Like, why was this something that you were interested in doing? What, why did you want to have your Spanish students um, merging with the culinary aspect as well? Um, well, and I think yeah, you guys are just gonna have to pull the microphone closer when you need to. Working with the Spanish three textbook and trying to design interesting lessons that were not just exciting to my students but to myself because I will be ultimately teaching them and want to enjoy teaching. Um, I found it very challenging to not only make it uh, meaningful for the students but meaningful to teach as well. It didn't feel like there was real application, real opportunity for students to um, develop their language skills with one another uh, in real context. And uh, because I do happen to teach culinary courses as well, it just seems so natural to blend the two together and offer students real life opportunity to, to exchange language with one another. And um, the kitchen is a great uh, setting for conversations. So um, that's, that's really where I was inspired to, to mesh the two. We have found language other than English a very lovely integration point for pretty much any CTE because if you have a second language under your belt, you are going to be far, far more employable than someone who doesn't. Uh, so yeah, I, I can see where that would be a lovely integration. Um, so Ian, why don't you talk a little bit then about your background and what made this uh, kind of integration interesting to you and your students. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, the timing was just right. It definitely fell into place with us putting the course together and um, we needed a third level music course that we could do with advanced students. Um, we wanted to keep them having this possibility of going all the way through high school and being able to take music every year if they wanted to and continue their craft, continue their training, theory, and all that, but give them more to think about and where to work on as they went. And so the entrepreneurship aspect fit perfectly. Um, I have a background in working professionally in performing arts, but I had also started in a small private school in New England, um, art and drama. And so, with an interest in business ownership and uh, what possibilities that could create for students, and having done uh, own, run an art business, a fine art business, for almost 20 years, but not well, um, on the side, I eventually took a, a business training course that was offered in Santa Barbara, where we live. And it was a very intensive course, involved a lot of math, which is very unpleasant for me, and uh, figures and forecasting and all of that, but writing a complete business plan. And it was, it was a revelation. I had never written a business plan before. And meanwhile, I was teaching somewhere else. This was before I came to Garden Street Academy. And so when John and I started talking about the possibilities, and I've been there for just over three years now, uh, teaching music and uh, music directing the musicals that we do, uh, we realized that if we were to empower students with the knowledge that young entrepreneurs and business owners would, could have, their idea and perception of what they're capable of could shift dramatically that they're stepping out of just the academic world of high school and maybe their elective courses and the fun stuff, whatever that might be, and realizing, wow, I can actually be thinking about how I might approach college differently. I could create my own business. And the, the revelation that, oh my gosh, my parents, they're entrepreneurs too. They own their own business. I never realized that. Um, so most of them were actually learning the word for the first time. They never heard the word entrepreneurship. And, and so pronouncing it first was the, the hard part. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and we use a text to support the course. But 
the pieces started fitting together for them. They start thinking about the music business differently, realizing all these musicians that are coming in, they're basically entrepreneurs. These people have started companies, instrument, uh, instrument manufacturers, uh, promotion and marketing companies, uh, a local conference that we have that we took students to. They're all entrepreneurs. And so when this all started to kind of fit together for them in their minds, they start getting excited and they start thinking about their own business ideas and, and where could they go with this. So really this, the, the big thing for us was empowering them with possibility so they don't feel like they're going out into the world, okay, I have to do high school, then I have to do college, then what? But if they are in high school and they're already studying and practicing these elements of entrepreneurship, they're learning about a business plan, they know what the elements of the business plan are, and practicing writing sections of it, they can be launched into a whole new area. Maybe they take over their family business, who knows, but in any case, it's, it's all about the empowerment. Um, one of the things that I wanted to add to that was just that when I um, was talking to Ian before, uh, before the conference, he, he had said something that I just thought was really um, life-changing in a lot of ways, which is that he felt his students could conceptualize themselves in the work world not just as employees, but as the people who have their own thing that they start. And I think after just being going through the economic meltdown that we just saw, I've done a lot of work with media um, and media professionals, and the, the people who really came out of that, um, I think, in successfully in many ways, were the people who had those entrepreneurship skills. So even if they didn't start their own media company, they brought, they were far more hireable as, you know, companies were trying to figure out how do we remake ourselves in this digital world when we were very print-based or that kind of thing. So that was very, that definitely stuck with me, like that, how nice if we could treat our students that we're not just preparing them to work for someone else, but that we might be preparing them to work for themselves, um, which I think translates into restaurant careers as well. So, um, Melissa, I'm going to hand it over to you because I want you to talk about your course a little bit in terms of um, what, you know, how you flow students through this language learning and also teaching them the culinary elements they need to know because there's a lot they need to know about trying to work in a working kitchen. Okay, um, so the course itself revolves around the text of the California Food Service Code. So we really do focus on what is, what are the procedures and what is the process of running a commercial kitchen. Um, so that is uh, basically the, the focus. And then, of course, the content is the language. So we, we look at the service code through the Spanish language. And students are reading, writing, talking to each other um, in Spanish. Um, the opportunity that this course brings that's different from the textbook is it allows for um, differentiation um, naturally because uh, we have native speakers, we have mixed abilities, um, which is the reality of all of our classrooms. Uh, so therefore, it, it allows for native speakers to work with, with um, first language learners and um, as an observer and facilitator, I'm able to see what areas or what, what grammar concepts individual students um, need to focus on, and I can pull them aside and work with that, work with them in a, in a natural way, so that it's not uh, the same grammar concept to all students, and perhaps it goes over their head. Some of them um, assimilate it, and some of them don't. It really gives me the opportunity to to observe students, exchange, and um, and to work with them on a one-to-one -one basis um, with certain grammar. Um, so that's one of the great aspects of this course. Um, critical thinking. It encourages critical thinking because uh, students are able to, to, to figure out how I'm going to use this language in real life context. So yes, I know the imperfect tense. Yes, I know the present progressive. But how do I put that together and use it um, in a conversation? So it really gives students uh, a platform for for using all of the grammar that they're learning and incorporate it in a natural way. So. To follow up on that, I think the next slide, or, or maybe a few slides down, is um, this one of the sample projects that you do in the class as the photo. So I think um, if you can talk about that, because I think that will help the audience contextualize like what, how students are using that language when they're together um, doing their projects. Right, so this is a project on um, a recipe that students were asked to research um, and the recipe 
that should be of uh, Latin American origin. Um, so they're getting the cultural aspect of uh, learning about foods in different Spanish-speaking countries. And alongside to that, they're developing language because they uh, they leave the session in the kitchen. So I don't I don't leave the session. I give students sentence frames and. Um, they come together with their recipe. They, uh, they design what their uh, presentation is going to look like to their peers. So one of them, for example, in this case, um, Emily was giving the direct instruction to the peers. And then Tiara would go around and assist the students through the process in the target language. Um, the really great thing about this is that even though we're not in a classroom, there is still sentence frames that students themselves have created, as opposed to uh, myself. And, um, and then there's also the recipe that they've designed. So it gives the students who are in the kitchen setting um, an opportunity to see what's being said to them in writing as well. So they're really using all of the functions at the same time. And that's what's really exciting about this project. Um, so that's and OK, then you have the second one yet yeah, that I want you to tell people about. Um, so this is uh, towards the end of the, the second semester already. Students are um, preparing to film a tutorial on how to set a formal table in Spanish. Um, and so this is the beginning stages where I've just showed the students a video on how various ways to fold napkins in Spanish. So the exciting part is students are doing and watching and listening and, and they're not picking up all the language, but they're picking up phrases and they're being exposed to different accents. And then um, the next step of this project was to have them um, learn and also write their own um, notes to teach one of the particular napkin folds to another peer in the classroom. And that's what's happening here. Um, so the students have their, their notes on the side. They're focused more on the listening, but they've already done the writing and the, the, the listening portion. So now, um, here they're teaching each other how to, to do this. And then um, the third step where I went to assess is they come up to me and they teach me what their partner taught them. So they're, they're not only assimilating what they've learned in the video and creating their own um, script to teach another student, but then they also have to show me that um, They've, they've integrated what their peers have taught them um, as well. So that's that project. There's so much, I mean, that's again, just pointing out the integration there, that marble cakeness, that they're learning the culinary and the language at the same time. So it just makes for such a really nice fit. English, by the way, makes for a really good fit as well. So um, I think you know any sort of language-based class, you get that really, really tight integration. Um, and Melissa had been saying, you know, a lot of her students apply for restaurant jobs over the summer, and this kind of skill makes them a lot more employable to be. Especially when you think about how fast language moves in a kitchen, where there's a whole lot going on, uh, it's just really useful for them to have that contextualized learning. And it also gives them the confidence of knowing that they've had some exposure to this, they have experience with it. And on top of that, they'll be able to communicate with the people in the kitchen, which um, at least speak Spanish, we don't know. So. Excellent. Um, okay, so Ian, that brings us to your course to talk a little bit about some of the projects in your uh, music entrepreneurship class, which I think when I had told people about this course, um, was not something that they would have thought entrepreneurship. Uh, I think they were sort of surprised that music and entrepreneurship were going together. And it is approved in, in visual and performing arts in, in that area. So, go ahead. It's such a good fit, really. And, and I have to put it in context for the students. Um, no matter which music class they're in in high school, they have field trips and there are visitors that come to the school and talk about their careers. But one of the places I really like to take them is to local recording studios. And we have a few pro recording studios in Santa Barbara that do major acts and, and they run a really tight ship. These are entrepreneurs who started these businesses, very small, and they've grown over the years. And most of them are relatively young. These uh, One has been doing it for uh, a little bit longer. We, we talked to him on our last visit. So they get to see what it's like for this um, almost one person show, maybe with a couple of employees to run a place that has to consistently get people in to keep it, keep their business alive. So putting in context in places like that, the entrepreneur as a recording studio owner, engineer. Um, also meeting with a concert, former concert promoter slash a retailer in the music world 
a man named Jim Salzer down in uh, Ventura. That's still down, right? Yeah, south from here. Um, I didn't think about where we were for a second. Okay. And, uh, and Jim used to promote concerts as a 20-something uh, guy in Santa Barbara and Ventura with acts like Jimi Hendrix, The Who, uh, and all the Led Zeppelin. He knew everybody, and he was just a young man who was an entrepreneur, and that was one of his businesses. He also got into music retail at that time, too. He's been doing it over 40 years. So they met, they met with him to ask him questions at his shop. How did you make it as a retailer? How did that work? How do you stay alive in this climate of video stores and music stores closing um, after a you know, major economical crisis but for his business multiple times in 40 years? And, um, and how did you make it as a promoter? How did that work? How did you meet people? So they, when we go on these field trips, they have to be prepared. Part of their homework is to ask business-related questions. They have to be prepared to ask, as an entrepreneur, how did you approach that? How did you plan it? Where did you fund your, how did you open a, a brick and mortar store? Where did the money come from? Things like that. So they're getting the wheels turning about what an entrepreneur has to do, which is a lot, to get something up and running. Um, and one other thing before this is that the New Noise Conference, we're lucky in Santa Barbara to have a young entrepreneur who has a, now in its sixth year uh, music conference with panelists like this, uh, songwriters, producers, uh, teachers, speaking about the music industry and all of the aspects of it. And the students were able to go there this year. They were given free tickets because he was so excited. To, you know, I knew the guy from a while back, but he was so excited that we had a, a class called the Business of Music, which is his life. Um, he was more than happy to give free tickets to everyone and extend that for next year and beyond. So there's that kind of support in the community we're finding where you connect with these business owners and entrepreneurs who want to support our high school students uh, having this kind of class and getting exposed. They have to see real life. How do people do this in the music world? It can't just be, you have to demystify the fantasy of, of you know, rock and roll that lifestyle, um, and you kind of break it down and look at what the rock and roll pro musicians that come into the classroom, what do they have to do to make it doing what they do? How do they survive? How do they make a living? How does the recording studio engineer make a living? How does the promoter make a living? How does an instrument company stay afloat in a climate where so many things are you know, being made out of the country? Um, and we were at an instrument maker in Oxnard, DW Drum, which specializes in American-made, right in Oxnard, California, their drums, and uh, takes great pride in that. And they don't make them all there, but they make most of them there. So the students toured the factory and met with the VP of sales and talked about how does how to have you made it? How does this work? Um, so this project here. Uh, this was a couple of years in the making. I, I got the idea from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. And uh, it, it's a very small scale version of a project they had that I would say is about seven times larger than that. Um, we don't really have the space for that. But um, it, it needed to be small scale so the students can wrap their heads around it too. Their deal, what, the whole idea behind it was um, having grown up with a lot of music and around Victrola players and things like that, I had a great appreciation for uh, older forms of uh, recorded media. And so what I wanted to do, when the time was right, and it wasn't until this class, have a project where students collected these items all the way from Edison Cylinder all the way up to the you know, intangible MP3, so we have an iPod representing that. As many forms of recorded media as we could to, to take them on a journey of, of sound. Most of the students at our school have never touched a 78 record. They've never touched an 8-track. Many of them have never touched a stereo cassette before. Um, so they didn't know the names of the things. They didn't know how to. They, they learn how to for the ones that we have players for. Um, uh, I even have a port of, I have a portable Victrola from 1924. That was my grandfather, so I bring that in. They all learn how to take a, an old 78, put it on the player, wind it up, and put down the steel needle. And I feel it's really important for students to know and appreciate um, what the journey has been for recorded sound and music, so they can kind of put now the, the, this intangible MP3 in context, this thing they don't even touch. Most of them don't even use CDs, so it's just all digital downloads. So we went back in time on this journey 
and their uh, project was to research each item. I gave them the items. I said, this is what we'll use in the display. Um, I didn't want to make it too hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to make it reasonable. So they did all the research on the items themselves. And they prepared a piece that was uh, well-written, proofread, you know, looked over numerous times, and mounted on, on foam core that was like a museum description of, of that item. So as you can see, we go from that, um, on the top left, the Edison cylinder um, and 78 records. We have reel to reel on the top right, the 33 and a third record, 45, 8-track. CD, um, this is Toe the Wet Sprocket. They're a Santa Barbara <laughs> band. And Toe the Wet Sprocket, um, Glenn Phillips, the lead singer, has come to visit our classes. Uh, and he's a very generous guy at this time. And he also, I just sent him an email the other day. I said, I wanted to know you guys were immortalized in our school display. I thought you would appreciate it since you're out touring again. Um, and so he was also one of the panelists at the local conference. So, um, and then we've got the stereo cassette, the mini uh, CD, and then an MP3 player to represent that we are now in the digital world. That's an old iPod. That's my old iPod. But it represents where, where, how far we've come. And, Yes, we've come far. We've had all these these great innovations, but but it's really important for them to appreciate what was around before and how their uh, great grandparents might have listened to music, because um, most of their grandparents probably listened to cassettes. There. <laughs> so um, anyway, so, well, I'm just honestly. I mean, I, I have a record player in the classroom, so they learn how to put a 33 and a third record on the record player and gently set the needle down, which for them is mostly they're doing it for the first time ever. They've heard, some of them have heard of records, uh, and their parents might have them tucked away in the closet. So it's because I'm so passionate about the history of music and, and the media itself, I really, really enjoy this project. And the students at first were kind of, you know, sort of a novelty thing, and then eventually they really got it. And, Preston, who just graduated here um, from our school on the right-hand side, was really invested in the, the design and the layout of the whole thing, so it flowed and felt kind of like you were you're going through a, a museum display. So this is a permanent display at the school. It was one of the hands-on projects we did. And there was a very long description, but I I just wanted to kind of give you the backstory. Well, I was going to say, it speaks to actually both sides of the learning because it shows students particularly how quickly all these things now are changing and that the way that you recorded music in one era is now, I mean, it's not even eras that separate them. And like, like you were saying, that's a really old iPod up there. I keep all my music on my phone now. And so we just all of these things are changing so quickly, and it gives them, I think, that entrepreneurship um, spirit as well, like how you have to evolve. Uh, so, bef I want both of you to talk about, because um, you were talking so much about uh, having so many people from industry involved, and certainly for me, I would say that a lot of teachers um, tell me when I'm at uh, Education for Careers and just different conferences and stuff, that they, the, the hardest thing for them is to maintain those industry partnerships and, and make um, businesses in the area involved. And it sounds like you guys have a lot of involvement. Um, and so if both of you could speak to how you how you develop those partnerships and, and keep people excited about being around your students and wanting to participate, that would be good. Well, I think we have a fair representation of both spectrums. I just started now at the end of the second semester to open dialogue with the culinary department at our local um, city college uh, as far as reaching out and being able to talk to the students that are going through the program and experience their, their um, food service uh, growth and development. Um, so as far as that's concerned, I, I'm just now starting to open up those partnerships and dialogues. And so it is a little intimidating to, to reach out to, to members in the community for the first time and explain to them what your process is, what you're doing, and what you'd like to do with them. Um, and so far, the response that I've gotten is positive. Um, we're looking forward to starting a, our relationship at the beginning of the new, new year, and I'm really looking forward to kick-starting that as soon as we get back to the second, next year, second year of this course. What I've found for, I, I don't have much of a filter on, you know, if I'll, I'll just call somebody, I'll call a musician or a call, I, I kind of feel like, you know what, we're, we're all human beings, we do what we do, um, we're, we're, we should be available to each other, just be a service, regardless of what our 
our work is. And you know what? Nobody says no to students. That's my experience. They all say yes, and they do it for free, and then they give you more. And it just is, it's so beautiful to see that. There's not a single musician that has said, no, I'm not coming. I don't want to. That's silly. They all say yes. The scheduling is the only issue, and usually they will. I've had, um, well, Glenn Phillips came from Toad. He came after having a gig until midnight the day before and getting off a plane or something like that. He was exhausted, and he didn't cancel. Um, most people will show up because they really care about, they're passionate about music and the industry, but they really, some of them have high school kids also, but they really are passionate about sharing their love of music and the industry of music with students, and they want the students to succeed. And, and one of my goals is for the students to really get that, that, that they really hear that and they really see that. We all want, we say at our school all the time, we, because we have a, a very kind and gentle approach that we, we're always supporting them. We really want them to succeed. There's no reason why we want anything different. So we do everything we can. So that's been the experience so far. Some of the people I knew already before I came to Garden Street Academy, um, some of the you know, I just chose a different a recording studio this year because it was through a contact that John had. Um, we can, any of these people have had open invitations to come back so other classes can return. And as I bring some of the same people, we also are seeking out new uh, professionals in the industry that can come speak at the school or uh, we can go and visit in town. The other factor in this is Santa Barbara's a small community. I want uh, to really emphasize the the sustainability of that and this local excitement that the, a lot of the kids may end up staying in the community, but that there are all these wonderful local businesses we have, and we want to sustain that as much as we can. We want people to come from other cities to record in Santa Barbara or come to our theaters and play in those theaters. So, just to sorry, just to add to that, um, every school has a kitchen and every school has a cooking staff that potentially speaks Spanish, so that's a great resource as well. For students um, to be able to experience both the content of food service and Spanish as well. I was going to add to that. Um, I think parents as well we sometimes forget. We sometimes as teachers we we're ambivalent maybe about parents coming in the classroom, but we have them come to back to school nights. You know, we we, we welcome them in general to our campuses, um, and it's it's not. Far to go to, to have to invite them to come and speak if they happen to be in the business that you're you know, in the subject area. Um, beyond that, many government organizations, city councils, water boards, they all have outreach people. I mean, most most companies have some sort of outreach or PR um, angle. So a lot of times there are people that are in fact looking for you. They're looking for schools. They're trying to get into schools, and they're finding it hard to get into schools. And when you make contact with them, it's hallelujah. Yeah, I have an example of, of that, too, with Rob Capello, who came. He's a, an internationally known composer and conductor and part of an educational project where he's trying to, he's going around the world, a lot of it for free, to educate people on, on music. focuses on music, but he's not like that. Now, through the interchange with, and they actually pursued us. He he needs to get his program out to children and uh, try it out, see what it's like to do it in the schools, and they just go around and do it for free in uh, schools around California. So that's an example where we were actually the just lucky recipients of this person who's now been willing to come twice in it extremely busy schedule. They just say yes to education, really. It's a wonderful thing to see take place. Yeah, and I think the parent tip is a really good one because even if even if you don't have an opportunity to have a lot of parent involvement, asking the parents, because the parents have a professional network, and so it, and they're definitely invested in having being able to have further their child's education. And so I think thinking even just beyond the parent and the fact that that person is probably working somewhere and has colleagues that may be interested in doing that work. And so, yeah, it just takes 
kicking it off um, in that way. So uh, I'm wondering if there's been interest in terms of more integrated curriculum. Maybe John, that might be something you would speak to. But whether whether other teachers in your school want to be doing courses like this for their subject area, or what what your plans are going forward. That's a good question. I think um, I think we have the willingness. I think we have um, teachers who are motivated and are willing to do the extra work that it takes. I mean, the difficulty is probably in writing the courses. It's technical. It's time consuming. Um, you would probably have had to have gone to a UCCI institute or to have written courses before. And I think for UCCI, that's that's something that they're absolutely uh, aware of, and that's where they're putting their energy is to have teachers come together and be trained to create courses, or even to, to creatively think of a course. You know, I think that can be hard. Even just you know, as we, as we said, you've got content areas, so it's double the work, and then. The layer cake is rejected. We don't do layer cake. Mm -hmm. so marrying CTE with traditional ADG is is hard, and um, I don't think any of my teachers would come to me necessarily to volunteer for this work. <laughs> um, but but the yes and I liked um, the yes and because if if you have a teacher, if Melissa says, "Well, I want to spend more time in culinary," well, I can say. Yes, and write the course script. Yeah. Um, or yes, and you know. You have to be willing to be flexible with how you integrate your course with culinary. For example, food service was what was available to integrate with culinary, so that's what we. Well. I was say, do you have other courses in the works that you're thinking of after after telling everyone how laborious it is? So then, yeah, so the, the other phraseology is the off the shelf, and so there's the UCCI off the shelf courses, and so I I've approached my English teacher to see if he would do English 10 UCCI course. I, the science teacher may be willing to look at biology connections. Is that there? Uh, violence. Violence. So, but I, I don't want to be, I don't want to, this was a really natural fit. So I, I want to go for fit and ease. I don't want to start, you know, try to enforce this kind of course. But I do think it's helping us as, an, as a group of educators. It's helping us to look at possibilities of, of somehow tying the strands and the themes of CTE and 21st century education and try to maybe um, articulate with our community, with our school community and the wider community, what it is we're trying to do and what the outcomes will be for students. And so um, there's, there's so much in this and there's so many opportunities and so many potential outcomes for this that it's extraordinary and it's exciting. So. We'll just do our best. There's one other slide I wanted to show you, if that's OK, of a project. Um, obviously, we don't, we don't leave out the craft of musicianship and training. They're always, uh, throughout the course, they're still getting uh, vocal and instrumental training, and they're doing their specialty, whatever their, their chosen instrument or voice, multiple things for most of them. So just quickly, I'm going to show you in this class of six this year, uh, we have an annual rock show. We've done in three years. We've done over 30 performances with the K through 12, not including the assembly. So there's musical theater, rock shows, um, all kinds of other showcases, winter, spring concerts, etc. But this was the first time one music class, and it has to be the right age, so it's the older students, designed their own showcase. So this is part of the course description. It's a very important part. But from the very beginning stages in planning what their, their songs are going to be, their set list, how and when, are they ticketing, are they charging uh, a fee for the tickets, are they going to promote the show, what kind of promotional materials are they going to use, posters, 
uh, online uh, social networking, all of that, they have to figure, af after having learned about it, they have to figure out how much of that they want to do and when. So they did that, and they went through that process, and it was, a, it was challenging because they realized they really needed to work backwards from the show date. And it got crunched in the last week in terms of promotion and marketing and all of that, and it was a great lesson for them. Hardest part for me was to stand back and not try to do a whole bunch of it. <laughs> so it was a great learning experience for me as a teacher, but they did a really good job. They played about a 15-minute show with uh, 11 songs and had a sold-out crowd, and it was called Night of Rock, and they came up with the whole concept and marketed them, uh, themselves. They had another student design the poster. They produced the poster and had the younger kids in the school color them, and they decorated the walls with them, so they got the whole school involved, and it really turned out to be very successful. So this was a, a practice in something that one might do uh, vocationally as a musician uh, in or out of high school, but probably when they've left high school, where they have to figure out, how do I create a gig for myself? How do I market it? Where is it going to be? What time? Who's going to go? All those questions have to be answered that seem like uh, maybe just a given. And they really just stop and think about all that. And throughout the whole process, they were being entrepreneurs. So it was wonderful. And they made some money that they decided they'd like to give back to the music program. So it was really great. Yeah, that's, I said that's you stepped in. Uh, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, um, I, I said, you decide if you want to sell tickets, how much they are, and then where that money goes is entirely up to you. It was a really interesting process and a fun project, and they did a seller show. That's fantastic. Um, so um, we're getting to the period where I want to be able to have people ask questions of our panel, because we're about 15 minutes shy of lunch. Uh, so I think we should go ahead and, and get started on that. Um, so go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Question about credentialing, as we always get. That's a Sarah question, more, more <laughs> for me, because I know that it came up at the council meeting that we had, and it's a tough one, and that's why you did it. That's yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, essentially, we have seen that happen differently in different districts, um, and so, uh, in terms of, I think in terms of Perkins funding, that person has to have a, a CTE credential. Um, if, if someone like Ian, who has been an entrepreneur for many, many years, would have no problem very quickly getting the CTE credential. And so I think um, we definitely have seen our courses get uh, get taught in different ways. And so sometimes it's by an academic teacher who also has a CTE credential. Sometimes it's by someone who is... Uh, just has the academic credential but hasn't yet finished the CTE credential and in some cases we have people who have a CTE teacher um, teaching the course who has a solid background in academics but doesn't necessarily have the academic credential because they have administrators in their district who are savvy at explaining how that person is qualified to teach the course. And, and I will say actually one thing that I, I really want to say um, and uh, before we, um, when we get back from lunch, I'll have a slide that if you're not on our newsletter, if you're not currently receiving it, I'll um, have the info to how to get on it. But one of the reasons I bring it up is that um, something that one of uh, one of our close contacts from uh, College and Career Academy Support Network, actually, Kaz and some of you are very with them. Actually, Patricia is here. Um, but one of our contacts uh, within Kazan is initiating conversations with CTC and CDE about the whole credentialing question because these issues are just going to get thornier and thornier as this whole linked learning pilot project really gains steam because this is the kind of curriculum that two-thirds of our students in California are going to be engaging with and somebody is going to be teaching it to them. So, um, so a lot of that is, you know, we're chipping away at it, but we as I said before, UC doesn't have any way of saying, yes, this person should be able to teach this course. Um, we, we, ha we have a, a teacher in Elk Grove who um, also, uh, he, he was one of the grantees along with OPA, and he wrote three courses, and they got approved in the, the various A to G areas that he wrote them for, um, and his district doesn't want to let him teach one of them.
uh, I think it's the Visual and Performing Arts credential. However, it's interesting to say, how does someone come up with all this curriculum if they aren't qualified to teach the course? And he's someone who has a very long background in theater arts, and so he, it could, he could get that credential, but there's all these hoops that he has to go through, and after having been teaching for 15 years, there just have to be ways that we help teachers become qualified to teach these courses without saying you have to follow that same path that everyone has. So soon I'm hoping in our newsletter to have some sort of update from CTC in terms of how that stuff is getting handled. Is that also to address the separate criteria for the Yeah, and I would imagine those are definitely going to be made at the local level as well. So, yeah. Other questions? None? No more other questions for our panel? There's got to be some questions. <laughs> Ian will just make you ask. Yeah. One of the, you just inspired me to kind of speak to the thing about the qualification element. Um, when it comes to vocational expertise or help, um, the people that would know the most about that would be the people that have done it. So uh, I think if a teacher have, has to trying to do it again, I mean, you know, all this space between professionally in the arts, and so you can impart these stories about how to do it and when and why. And I, all of these things can be offered. And I think that's a great way to give back to the learning community because they, they need to know, again, that it's real, that it's possible. So when we're talking about vocational stuff, that, that they could do this too. Yeah. Yes. So a, a, a question for John, or actually for anyone at the panel. So what has been the reaction of the parents to courses like this? I mean, we get, we get it on both ends. I mean, on one hand, is this course really going to prepare my son or daughter for, for college? Or, or is the reaction? Far more positive, but it's a the, the, it's kind of a lot of look at, at the curriculum and how that shapes a student. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, our parents are typically supportive of initiatives that we come up with. Um, I think um, we don't really have any trouble as far as persuading our constituents. And as I mentioned, the way we designed our school and the way we set it up was to have heterogeneous groupings, to have mixed ability um, within the school, to have to not have these honors and AP courses. Um, philosophically, I have to say, I have to confess that we're probably not in favor of the AP curriculum generally. And there are some other schools that have gone down that path and have changed and moved away from AP for you know good reason or, or not. And I know those are battles that people have with parent constituents because, you know, race to nowhere, parents are convinced that they need X, Y, and Z, and they're going to be on the baseball team as well as having five APs that, you know, scoring five on each one. Um, we, when we designed our school, we designed the curriculum and the program, we decided that's not who we were going to be, so we don't actually attract those parents. And <laughs> it is, you know, it's refreshing. Um, <laughs> however, it never, you never satisfy it, you never scratch that itch that parents have when they come in and they view your school and they're looking at you, maybe the public school, maybe the church school, maybe the other school, and want to know, you know, they want direction of how it's going to lead their kid into Berkeley, Harvard, wherever they want, wherever they think their kids are going to go. And um, all we can do is be honest with them and say, I'm sorry, but that's not what we offer. And so if that's what you want, that it's not going to happen for you here. Um, so it's a little brave new world, um, but it's commensurate with this with what we're doing here today, too. So I think that you can introduce CTE and integrated courses, and you can go more of a project-based program. Um, you're you're not, never going to convince every constituent that it's for the benefit academically of their child. And that's unfortunate, but 
you know, if if we don't catch up with the information age, then you know the quote is, um, I believe that if we don't, if we're not teaching, I'm going to get this horribly wrong, by the way. But um, the idea being that we have to be able to teach tomorrow to our children, you know, it, especially now because. It's so fast moving. The digital age, the information age, the education age, it's so fast moving that as educators, I feel like we're going to be left behind and we're going to be embarrassed by that. Yeah. Um, comment and uh, question. Uh, we were talking on sidebar here about how we get around the credentialing issue. Teach where you have the academic instructor working with the CTE instructor together, and we've seen beautiful models of that with the geometry and construction and, and that type of working together. So, for those folks who are interested in seeing how you can get around the credential, and that might be one way to do it. And I also had a question for Ian and Melissa. Um, and do you see how uh, entrepreneurship can be applied in other disciplines? And Melissa, I I think you started to talk about how you might be integrating entrepreneurship or some business concepts in the program that you are working with now. Um, so, it's definitely because we have the luxury of having um, Santa Barbara City College's culinary program, I think it's second in the nation. Um, we have access to that and we can build relationships with that. And to add to that, we have so many local restaurants that I'm sure even if I when we got positive responses from 50%, it would be plenty to work with. Um, so in that sense, yes, I would like students to be able to see what their career opportunities are um, in the culinary industry. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's very important for us to talk about non-music-related entrepreneurship, and uh, that's it's fundamental to the course. It, the text that we use, um, has very little, if no mention, of music in it. So most of the readings they're doing are about a huge variety of companies, uh, from coffee companies to a major industry, you know, heavy uh, machine industry, that kind of thing, um, to provide examples of how businesses have grown and developed. Um, so one of the discussions we had in class at one point, because we do have a lot of discussions, is, uh, was about um, what kind of business would you start if you were to start a business, say, right out of high school? And none of them had the, talked about starting a music business. Um, two of them were actually very interested in um, athletic clothing that was geared towards young women because they both played competitive sports and they felt like there's just not enough. We have to wear guy stuff all the time. We got to wear guy knee pads and everything is this size or whatever. And and, uh, and, and they were very serious about it. They had all these great ideas right away. They were just brainstorming it like crazy. Um, and. Another student was talking about the family business and that they actually were kind of interested in the business that their parents had started. So, um, yes, yeah, so I want to motivate and encourage them to be thinking outside of music. That's just our, our general framework. And so we do have those discussions and um, they're, they're making the connections in other places. Uh, a couple of the students came in uh, twice, the same two students came into the classroom so excited to share this story that they had been uh, one in another class on campus where the teacher brought up entrepreneurship and asked if anybody knew what that was. And their hands shot up in the air and they answered as to what it was. And he said, wow, that's great. You didn't know about, uh, that was in the beginning of the year when we started, of course. And then another one was uh, in town. They were meeting with somebody that's a professor at UCSB and she brought up the topic. So you maybe don't know what that is. And he said, oh, no, I know what it is. He said, well, how do you know? He said, we learned it in music class. So, um, you know, they're, the idea that they're getting empowered, that it, it may or may not be related to music for them, but um, that it's all around them. It's everywhere. It's in our community. It's what sustains our community, the entrepreneurship spirit. Uh, we're not a community that has lots of enormous companies. They all started very small. Uh, and that globally, there's the, this opportunity for them to get involved in entrepreneurship no matter what the, the uh, area of interest is, whether it's music or something else. But yeah, I'm going to make sure we talk about those. Keep it wide open. Does that answer the question? <laughs> um, 
the city of Dallas and the Cambridge Sunday Club. Uh, um, <laughs> I just have a quick question about the CTE camp. What is the So the question is about um, how this how this course essentially would fit into a CTE pathway, and is it the capstone, and what happens in earlier courses? I think for you guys it's a little bit different since you have mixed ages in the classes, but um, go ahead and speak to it. Well, yeah, we do have some mixed age groups. Um, for us, as I was saying about the you know, starting this process and then realizing that there is potential to articulate a program. So. Uh, pathway if you like and I think we're starting to see that we could have that, we could develop that and it's going to take a lot more work but we would like to be able to have a four year entrepreneur program. I know there are schools that have that um, and one of the things that I want to do is go and visit those schools and see how that, what it looks like, see what it, what's involved, what resources are necessary. Because we, I think what we're finding is that perhaps what we didn't realize was the, the interest, the passion that students have for this. I think it caught us a little bit by surprise. And now we want to be able to develop it on the back of that, you know, on that wave of student interest. Um, because, they, because when you compare the course, these two courses with what was previously offered, um, there is much more excitement kids and then and there are they want more. Want more. They don't want they don't want to go back to, you know, page thirty nine, exercise one, one to twelve, ten minutes. Write it down. Okay, now let's go over it. <laughs> Do it. So, they, they want something different. They really do. And, and and they are, they're already getting something different in their lives. That's, that's a frightening thing for us, both as parents and educators. They, they already have access to everything they could possibly want, more than any of us had at their age. Um, and I'm not saying that we necessarily need to, to you know, um, meet every need and every whim that, that kids have in our care, but I do think that we have to move a little bit with them because we're, because they're not going to engage in the same way with us as their educators. You, know, you see, I mean, I see it. I don't want to sound like a fogey, but you see attitude shift, and you see students are quick to leave the classroom and get back to what it was they were doing in the five minutes before they. You know, it's, it's difficult. I think one of the exciting things about teaching language uh, this year as opposed to last year is to see students come up to you outside of the classroom context and engage you in the language. And not just me, but the community and staff that we have as well that are predominantly Spanish speaking. I see um, students try to begin or even um, carry on conversations with the staff, which is a great community builder and a great cultural exchange for, for everyone. Okay, one more question, and then it'll be time for our, our break. But yes, Mike, is that you? It's hard for me to see. I want to refer back, John, to the question here, to the conversation you were having with um, Stephen earlier about the brain of the world. Your school's very unique. Many of us come from traditional public conferences. Only thing we'll even look at is AP, IB, or UC group courses, even though UCTI are a group courses. We can't do those courses in long term UC. That's kind of the mindset many of us face in the conference place. Could we talk a little bit about how we change that mindset to be a little bit more open minded to a great new world you're describing because Common Core is asking for all those critical thinking skills, those higher level authentic assessments you guys describe in your school. Yet the irony we face here is that we can't do that because we're so focused on our PLTs, we've got to do math better, we've got to do English better. Did somebody from either UC or you guys talk a little about how better to change that mindset? 
Well, uh, one of the things that I have been saying is that I really think that um, we in UC admissions need to be clearer to parents about what the pathways are. And it's actually something that we are currently undergoing, which is beginning to collect that data to see um, whether certain things that people believe about how to get into UC are actually true, or whether they, I mean, we have the data, but we're beginning the analysis process. Because there are a lot of things that people think, as John was saying, you have to have a full course load of APs and also be, you know, like you're saying, the baseball star and maybe have opened your own business and, you know, also <laughs> advised Obama in foreign policy to get into UC. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but often, you know, those things are not necessarily the case. And so I think. One of the things that I would like UC to be doing is to be, ta especially in the system-wide office, I mean, the campuses have their own messages that they tailor to people um, within the community, uh, but I think we at the system-wide office have a responsibility to be saying, these are the different kinds of pathways that you can take to get to UC, and it doesn't have to just be about this full spectrum of APs. Um, we've actually had people and I don't know how this would end up affecting John. John's courses are UC approved. I mean, they're they're both they they both have A to G approval. But um, but uh, we have had numerous requests from people who want to implement our courses, who want them to have an honors bump um, because they feel that the courses are so rigorous that they deserve the the weight of um, of that honors weight. And so. Uh, I just think a lot of the responsibility is on us to get better about that messaging because you're right, you guys have to deal with parents and parents have their ideas about what they um, think is makes up an education for their their kid. I don't know if that was the best answer, but... <laughs> no, I just add to that. I do, I mean, I see the, the shift being more at the educational policy level, the, you know, the legislative level, if you like, or the UC regents level. Um, I think as far as, I think one thing that we can change is as administrators, and again it goes back to the yes and idea, um, is, is perhaps just an attitude shift. If we can, and I think perhaps in, uh, in the teaching of administration, if it could be but there could be more models of distributed learning, if there could be more models of collaborative um, decision making, if schools could have flatter hierarchies where teachers were given prominence for their creativity and for their ideas and encouraged, I think those are some attitude changes. Uh, but I also think that we, we would collectively agree that our own staffs do have positive attitudes, they do have the potential to adopt new ideas and be successful in change. I would perhaps argue that you have to go a step further, there has to be some extra added ingredient, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, you know, PLCs, people are rolling out PLCs and, and devoting more time for teacher development, teacher collaboration. I mean, those are good initiatives. Um, but as we've discovered today, you know, the work involved in this type of course is heavy workload. And um, so we're, we're asking to provide more time, you know, more resources, more time to this. And uh, as with everything in education, that tends to be what's required is time and money. So, um, it's a, you know, but I think we're a happy band, you know, we're, we're as, as Oprah said, I think the journey begins, we just have to, you know, just have to march forward. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I would just follow up on that, Mike, to say that I think the journey, that's the thing, is I think we're starting it, and this, the beginning of something is always the, the most difficult part because other people's minds haven't changed yet. And so I think um, particularly with the linked learning pilot project coming up and um, all of those districts being involved that there's there's not going to be a choice but to change how things are happening. And I think when people see how rigorous this curriculum is and that as we move forward with it and can have some full set of data to say that yes, 
um, students are doing better with this kind of curriculum, or we're catching students who more we weren't catching before and who we weren't um, getting to think of themselves as college material or even see any kind of future for themselves. I think that's when those shifts are going to happen. But you're right, in the meantime, we're in this uncomfortable area. The thing that I frequently say that that is tough about UCCI is that we create these, we bring teachers together to create these really unique and innovative and interesting courses, and then they have to get shoved into the regular box of school that has not changed much at all. Um, and so, you know, we just have to keep We remind people the, the goals underlying the A3G subject requirements are absolutely consistent with the goals underlying Common Core. And so it's a perfect alignment, it's a perfect articulation here. And so we need to work together on that. So where we at UC are trying to offer up our support in that regard is to work with our faculty to review and revise the A3G course criteria and the guidelines, which was a project that took place over the course of this last year. We have, I think some of you may know already, um, and if not, this is a great opportunity for me to share the information. We have posted on our A through G guide um, in PDF form right now the, those clarified, revised A through G course criteria. We feel very strongly that the more transparency we have on the expectations of what will meet A through G approval, the better we can help you get your courses A through G approved, especially if you're offering courses that are Common Core aligned, that are going to be more of this integrated type, linked learning type. And you know, to speak to the point that Sarah was making just now about the observation people are making of the level of rigor of these integrated courses. Um, we recently also changed our honors policy. This was approved by the faculty senate committee that oversees that policy that in essence um, opens up the door for more school created, possibly integrated courses to receive approval for, for the honor status, for the honors bump. So these are all things, um, I guess the, the last thing that I wanted to be able to share, um, is that, we have to is that we, we're undergoing a process right now of totally redesigning our, our A through G database system that where, where you submit your courses for um, review and approval. Um, many of you know it as doorways um, or the A through G online update site. We're in that process of the redesign, completely overhaul, and we've taken the 
long list of, of your frustrations and your, your offerings of, of recommendations for improvement into mine when we embarked on this process. And our new system, which we have named the A3G Course Management Portal, is really going to be our online space to collaborate in this effort. One, one major difference between the new system and our current system is that any registered user, whether you're a teacher or counselor, curriculum developer, administrator, if you register to get into the system, we're going to provide you access to see the full course description of any A through G approved course offered throughout the state. Yeah. We're that repository, right? So there's, there's no point for us to just keep it narrow where I'm submitting my course in Area B for English, and I'm focusing on just that, where everyone is trying to align the common core. Everyone is trying to um, offer up the best quality courses for their students, and so why not share those ideas with everybody? Um, that's just one of the major improvements with that system. I could go on and on, but I won't because I'm not going to go over it. So, I'll well, <laughs> I just want to say that the, the note that I would like to end on. Um, speaks to the risk-taking factor, which is really the way that I want to thank all of our guests today, because I think, especially when you think about that there are huge risks to undertake this kind of curriculum, and we think about Oqua and Gregory um, coordinating different high schools, and it's really on them to, to, you know, it was their idea, and if things blow up, you know, they have to take the heat on that, and they put themselves out there to, to start making change in their district because they felt it was, they, it was important. Um, and the same to be said for John, Ian, and Melissa, who who are creating these courses and trying to give their students something that they really think their students need and tuning out, you know, all of the other messages that they might get about why they should be loading up their curriculum with APs or that kind of thing. So um, in the spirit of honoring risk takers, which are the people I prefer to be around, uh, please give everyone a round of applause. And now we should all go eat. <laughs> so, um, it, we went a little bit over time, uh, but um, so I think what we should do is reconvene at 1.30, because I think 45 minutes, you need more than half an hour to be able to, you know, take a break if you need to, but also get to meet the people who are here, because those will be the people who help you take those risks and help to start making this kind of change. So enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back at 1.30.